Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All right, uh, everybody raise your hand like this. Uh, Most of you know I injured my hand, cut a tendon about 10 weeks ago. Uh, Today's communion Sunday, so I want you to do what I've learned to do, tabletop. Can you do a tabletop? (laughs) This is to remind us we're going to be gathered around the table here, tabletop. And then, can you do that? Can you have those fingers? This hand does it pretty good. <laughs> How about that? I do that six times a day. Six times a day. To be flexible. To be flexible. Isn't that why we come? To learn how to be flexible in our faith? Maybe. Um, I invite you to take the attendance pad, sign your name, pass it along the length of the pew, and uh, Please uh, consider joining us in Molyneux Lounge for a time of fellowship following worship today. Uh, look forward to it. Today, um, we celebrate our freedom in Christ and what it means to be God's free people. Yes, we can. there. Whoa, all right. I have an announcement. So, when my kids were this age instead of that age, I did vacation Bible school and I taught and I had a great time. But now my kids are that age and her kids are this age. I can't do that anymore, but there are other ways to participate. And so what they need is food and donations and anything you think you can do to help out. So think about VBS, think how much fun it was, and think of the way that you can participate too. Thanks. Let us prepare ourselves now to worship the living God. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, choir. Good morning, Steve. Good. Thank you. Would you please join me in the responsive call to worship 
please stand if you're able. We come to this place of prayer. For here we can bring our hopes and dreams, our hidden fears, and the doubts we dare wear on our sleeves. We come to this place of grace. For here we learn compassion and joy. We come with these people called the church. To be blessed by the variety of gifts, to live as one for our God. You may be seated. Let us continue to come to the light as we share in the prayer for forgiveness. Would you join me, please? Enslaved to sin, we cannot see the lives we lead, God of glory. Each day and every day, There are those times when we ignore you and your dreams for us. Each week and every week, we find time to ridicule others when we could have affirmed them. Each moment and every moment, though we do not want to admit it, we seek our own way rather than walking along your path of joy and obedience. We come asking forgiveness for our foolish lives, eternal blessing. Deliver us 
and break the chains of sin and death which hold us captive. Open us to that grace you offer and give us the gift of the Spirit so we may live as people of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was God, and at the end will be God, and each moment in between there is God, creating, redeeming, and sustaining us. Gracious love is poured into our empty souls. Through the Spirit, peace becomes the gift we can share with those around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I invite you to stand and share the peace with those who are near you. Come on up here and see. I got that is upstairs in the balcony. There's a place where they record all that's going on up here. That beautiful stained glass up there? That's called the rose glass. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Kira. <laughs> all right. You know what? Okay, I bet you guys noticed 
all of my friends here. Notice that I have some special people with me today. These are my grandchildren. That's Kira and Dax. What's your name again? Kane and Chloe. And they came with us to talk about, guess what? So, does anybody know what tomorrow is? Who said 4th of July? Woohoo! Okay, no, you don't have to say it. All right, 4th of July. And what do we sometimes call 4th of July? Do you know? Nope, that's Pentecost, but it's close. Very close, very close. We call it Independence Day or Freedom Day. So what does it mean to be free? Anybody got an idea? To do whatever you want. Yeah, pretty much. That's what you think of, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, that is a smart thing. So by doing everything that you want, or anything you want, with that comes a lot of responsibility, doesn't it? Because if you're going to do anything you want, part of that is you don't want to hurt someone else, right? Because if I want to do anything I want, and I want to, oh, knock you guys over. Not a cool idea at all. Not good. However, if I do want anything I want and I say, hi, Annabelle, I'm so glad to see you, that is a good thing. That's a cool thing, right? Okay. So, did you know that to have that freedom, people had to fight? They did. You know, just like we talked about on Memorial Day, they didn't fight like this. They had to fight. They had to work hard for that freedom. They had to do things that they would have never thought they had to do. And you want to know something else? They were not all Presbyterians. <laughs> what? I'm not kidding you. And that's our brand of Christian. You guys probably don't know that, but that's our, okay, that's our name, our family name, but they... I gotta tell you something else. You ready for the shakaroo? They weren't all Christians either. What? What? Yeah, that's the history of it. That I know. That's, I know, that's just crazy. But they all came together, each one of them, and they worked together to be free. Even if that freedom is a giggler right next to me. <laughs> because they knew it was very important to be free. So, since we are free, and that means we can do almost anything we would like to do, I think we should celebrate that. And I brought things to celebrate with. So if you're gonna be free though, don't you think you should be free just like me? Don't you think you should wear pink nail polish? No? You think you should be free like you instead? Yep. Well, why don't you? No, but no nail polish. Okay. Well, if you're gonna be free like you, then maybe you want to pick out your own kind of musical instrument. What do you say? I have combs, and I have kazoos. Do you know how to play a comb? And if it's a kazoo, I think I'll take that one. His lips are gone now. Who knows how to play a kazoo? Show me. Other end. And hum. Hum, hum. <laughs> Ready? Hum. Here you go. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. So you want a comb or a kazoo? How about this kazoo? Hum into it. Okay. Here you go. Pick out what you want. And because we don't all have to be the same, you might want a flag or a pinwheel. Do you want a flag? Do you want to pick out a flag or a pinwheel? Yeah, come on. Pass them on down this way. Pass them on down this way. Pass them on down this way. Good, yeah, sexy one. Do you want a comb or a kazoo? There you go. You can have that. All right, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Well, we got to pass these down here. I got pinwheels and I got flags. Yeah, yeah, who else needs some? We need to get these all the way down here. Oh, gosh, darn. I think you can. You can have two. I have a pinwheel and a flag if you want to. Can you have all this? No, no, don't need the freedom for that. Gosh, darn, look at all this. Do you? Did you get a flag and a pinwheel? You go right ahead. Whoopsie, sorry about that. You need, a, you need that? <coughs> well... 
you know, with all this stuff. What are we going to do with all this stuff up here? I think we... Wait a minute. Is that the train whistle? We must be going to have a parade. Who wants to have a parade? Let's have our freedom parade. Woohoo! All right, let's go. I'm a Yankee. Yankee doodle do or die. Nope, nobody knows this. The real life nephew of my Uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. She's my Yankee doodle sweetheart. She's my Yankee doodle joy. Yankee doodle went to London just to ride that pony. I am that Yankee doodle boy. <laughs> All right, I have pinwheels if anybody needs pinwheels. I don't know, you might need a pinwheel. I think you do. I think you guys, do you guys need a pinwheel over here? <laughs> la, 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 plenty of pinwheels. I know Mike missed me. <laughs> Good to see you. Pinwheels here? And they are free to be thee. <laughs> That's why he does not get the microphone. Do we need some pinwheels over here? Yeah. I have pinwheels. Anybody interested? No? Okay. Plenty of pinwheels to go around. I'll leave one with you, my dear. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Oh, I know, this is a, it's a sober task to be an elder, but when you need a pinwheel, you need a pinwheel. <laughs> it does clash with your suspenders, which means it stands out uniquely. And for your freedom, thank you everyone for celebrating freedom with us. It appears that we also have an additional little doll up here who wanted to celebrate her freedom. If you didn't get a pinwheel, there are more up here. Well, one of my passions uh, and hobbies is reading about the life and career of Abraham Lincoln. And in a recent biography, I came across a line I'd never seen by him. He said early in his career in a speech, he said, I have been a slave. I have been a slave. What he meant by that is up to age 21, he was for all intents and purposes an indentured servant to his father. And his father rented him out for labor and kept all the proceeds of Lincoln's work. Lincoln never saw any of the earnings uh, from his work. And so early in life, he developed a, a sympathy for those who, uh, in some respects, had the work of their hands <coughs> and lives stolen from them. We have two hymns that we're gonna sing, at least one verse from Lift Every Voice and Sing. The reason I include this is I learned this and learned to treasure it in an interracial church I served in Cincinnati for a number of years. This in many ways is the freedom song of the African American community, the African American church, lift every voice and sing. Written about 1900, um, and it was done at a time um, in celebration of the freedom that Abraham Lincoln also had to contribute and the work of African Americans in seeking their own freedom. We'll sing the first verse and then we will um, move immediately into the second hymn, O Beautiful for Spacious Sky. Please stand if you're able as we sing together.
please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. God of fresh beginnings, you make all things new in the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Make us agents of your transforming power and heralds of your reign of justice and peace that all may share in the healing Christ brings. Amen. The first lesson today is from the fifth chapter of Galatians. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 16. You know that the book of Acts is sometimes referred to as the Acts of the Apostles, but it is also uh, called by scholars really the Acts of the Holy Spirit because throughout the whole book, the Holy Spirit is driving the disciples out to mission, uh, supporting them, doing all kinds of acts of power uh, through them. So this is a story from chapter 16 in that book. One day, we were on our way to the house of prayer when we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and her owners were making a great deal of money off of her because she was telling people's fortunes. Now she began to follow us, and as she followed, she cried out, these men are the slaves of mighty God, and they proclaim a message of salvation. She did this every day. until the Apostle Paul got really irritated. And he turned around and he spoke to the Spirit and he said, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And so the Spirit left her immediately. But the owners of the slave girl when they saw that their hope of financial gain was gone, seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the marketplace before the authorities, where they said to them, these men are disrupting our city, they are Jews, and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for Romans to adopt or to practice. And the crowds who were around jumped on them also. And the magistrates said, strip them naked and beat them with rods. And when they had flogged them seriously, they took them to the jail and told the jailer to hold them securely. So he took them to the innermost cell and shackled their feet and locked the door. Now it was about midnight and Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, and the prisoners were listening, when all of a sudden there was a mighty earthquake. 
and the foundations of the jail shook and all the cell doors opened and all the prisoners' shackles fell off. When the jailer woke up and saw that the doors of the prison had been opened, he took his sword because he was about ready to kill himself because he feared that all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. So the jailer had all the lights turned on, and he fell trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. And he said to them, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your household as well. And then they spoke to them the word of the Lord. At that same hour, the jailer brought them out and he tended to their wounds. And then he was baptized that very same hour with all those who were in his household. And then he brought them into the house and he set food before them. And the jailer and all his guests and Paul and Silas celebrated that this man had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. powerful story, but it's a, a strange story, because as you listen to this story from Acts, we read about what is quite possibly the worst attempt to escape from prison that has ever been written, because nobody really escapes. Now, I know it might be something of an exaggeration to say this, but I can't help but notice how strange the story is. Anyway, I mean, when compared with most every other prison escape story I've ever heard about or seen in a movie, ha can you recall some prison escape movies you've seen? I mean, when I, when I read this story, I can't help but be reminded of the daring escape of other prisoners, like uh, Edmond Dantes escaping from Chateau d'If in the story of the Count of Monte Cristo. He's in the prison. You think he's going to die there. What does he do? Another prisoner dies, and he, he takes that dead prisoner out of the body bag. He climbs in, sews himself up. They haul him out of the prison, think they're going to bury him. They throw him over the cliff into the ocean, and he escapes. Now, that's, a, that's an escape story, right? Or, or Andy Dufresne, uh, that character in the Shawshank Redemption. Anybody see that movie, Shawshank Redemption? He's there unjustly, and he figures out a way to escape through the prison sewer system, whatever it takes. My personal favorite, my personal favorite, is Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. He climbs on a motorcycle and goes roaring down the road. Now, that's an escape from prison, isn't it? Those are true prison escape stories. We love those breathtaking, defy the odds, escape to freedom stories. We enjoy it when a lovable scoundrel or someone who has been unjustly imprisoned finds a way through luck, through skill, through scheming to escape. But if you notice something is missing from today's prison break story, the something that's missing is an actual escape. No one truly escapes to a degree. The jail cells are opened by an earthquake. The shackles on the ankles of the prisoners are uh, released. 
The jailer himself, now this is what a prison escape story is all about. The jailer is knocked unconscious. And you think Paul and Silas, they've got a way to get out of there. But the strange thing is, they don't leave. Instead of escaping, Paul and Silas remain in their jail cells, and, and you've got to ask yourself, what, what's going on here in a story as strange and odd as this? And then maybe remember, maybe we remember something about how God is present with people. God is present with people even in places of imprisonment, whatever that might be. God is present in times of imprisonment, sometimes doing mighty works in those particular circumstances, far beyond what we might ever imagine. I mean, after all, if we remember Jesus, what does Jesus say? I was in prison, and you visited me. Even in prison, God's there. We know this story. We've heard it all down through the ages. Recall Martin Luther King, Jr., you remember, he was in prison actually more than once or twice. He's famous for that letter from a Birmingham jail, freely accepting his imprisonment because he couldn't rest or feel free until the ugly chains of segregation were broken. And the thing is, when he wrote that letter, he wrote it to a group of clergymen, and I do mean clergymen, because that's all there were at the time. In fact, he wrote this letter, and there's a Presbyterian minister included in the letter, and I think the effect of his letter was to say, how come you're not here in prison with me? We're here to set people free. How come you're not inside with me? Or remember Nelson Mandela imprisoned on Robben Island off the coast of South Africa. Do you remember how long he was in prison there? 27 years. You'd think his spirit would be broken by that. 27 years in prison. But rather than his spirit being broken, his spirit and faith grew stronger until the chains of apartheid in South Africa were broken. They thought they had imprisoned him and stopped the movement of freedom, but in actuality, by being imprisoned, he broke the chains of slavery in a whole nation. Or think of Charles Colson from the Nixon years, the infamous Nixon years imprisoned for his crimes in the Watergate fiasco, if you can recall that sort of story, and you figure that's the last we'll ever hear of Charles Colson. He goes to prison, but he has a conversion in prison, and what does he end up doing for the remainder of his life but accepting a call from the Spirit of God to prison ministry, to helping those in prison, not just innocent people, but guilty people, Learn what it means to experience freedom again. So yes, we know God can do some powerful things when the powers that be think they've got God's people locked up, their faith imprisoned, and their hopes dashed. In fact, I think that's especially where God wants to be at work in our lives and in the world. And that's what begins to dawn on us in this story today from Acts, maybe, maybe this story is really not really a, a prison escape story after all. In fact, I'd like to suggest it's a parable. It's a parable about human solidarity and, and human trust, about overcoming our fears of each other and being healed, as this powerful story says at the end, by sharing in each other's brokenness and woundedness because the jailer washes the wounds of his prisoner. You see, the jailer and his prisoners actually, understandably, should have feared each other. They had good reason to. They should have distrusted each other and maybe even hated each other because really that's how evil works. That's how evil works in the world. If if we observe that we're starting to feel hate and mistrust of other people, that's, a, that's an indication that there's a different kind of spirit at work in our lives than the spirit of Christ, which we see working in the book of Acts. You see, evil seeks to divide and conquer by getting people to hate and fear each other, to believe the status quo, keeping everything the same, 
is preferable to change. I love what President Ronald Reagan said one time when he was defining what status quo means. The status quo, Reagan said, status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. It's Latin for the mess we're in. And the human predicament is to be involved in a mess where we hate and distrust each other and we <coughs> divide. And, and you know what happens when we are divided. We're conquered by an evil spirit. Think about it from the jailer's perspective in our story from Acts. Here are two men, two outsiders, Paul and Silas, who come into town and they've disturbed the peace. They've disturbed the fabric of society by their actions, accused of advocating beliefs that go against the very fabric of society and everything that jailer believes and holds dear. And, and then they've gone and done something really bad. That story of the slave girl who has this gift of divination, she can foretell the future. She's uh, actually being exploited by her owners. This is an early story, you might call it, of human trafficking. They're using her for economic advantage. And the ministry and presence of Paul and Silas is to release her from that economic bondage. Now, if you really want to get in trouble, I've learned, take your Christian faith and begin to examine the injustice of economic conditions in the world. When I grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina, at one end of Hay Street, the main street in town off of which my own church was located, there was a whole series of bars for the young GIs from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And you can imagine what went on in some of these bars. Some strange things. And the preachers in town loved to rail against the evil of the bars in town. Loved to. I heard it more times than I care to remember. But did I ever once ever once hear a story from the pulpit about how these GIs were taken advantage of by business people in town who charged exorbitant interest rates when these young GIs wanted to buy a car or when they rented housing and were gouged by local Christian business people. Did I ever hear that? No. But you see, if you take your faith and realize it applies to all of life, it's not just to our inner spiritual emotional liberation, it's to freedom and liberation from bondage in all parts of life. As you read the story from Acts, you begin to see that every person who comes into contact with Paul and Silas is made to be a freer human being. You see, the gospel is about forgiveness, but it's not just about forgiveness. The gospel is also about freedom. The freedom, as Paul says in Galatians, to be set free by Christ in every dimension of our lives. Now, in a way, I feel like we're in a very similar moment in our culture right now. We're caught in a story of freedom and fear in our nation and world. We're caught between fear and freedom. If we're conservatives, we're supposed to fear liberals who are destroying the fabric of American society. And if we're liberals, we're supposed to distrust conservatives who are labeled hateful and prejudiced toward others. If we hold to a traditional understanding of gender, we're supposed to fear transgendered persons. And if we count ourselves as progressives, we're supposed to fear people flying the Confederate flag in our country. And if we have guns, we're afraid of those who might take them from us. And if we're people who fear guns and the violence that they may bring, we have over 300 guns in our society, did you know that? And yet I'm not sure with 300 guns in our society that much of any of us feels freer for having them. But still we're at odds with each other about these and other things. In fact, everything, and I think everyone in our 
society is imprisoned in this idea that we're supposed to distrust each other and fear each other, and we're so prone, so prone to letting people manipulate our fears to sowing distrust <clears throat> and suspicion of each other. I've got to tell you, there's no future in that, none whatsoever. And that's where I think Paul and Silas offer us this holy, radical, and simple example of what it looks like to live a life freed from that kind of oppressive fear. And goodness knows we all need it. As the jailer is about to kill himself in order to preserve his honor in the wake of his failure, Paul and Silas say these wonderful, powerful, liberating words. We're still here. We're still with you. You are not alone. We are in this together. Now imagine that. Imagine that if that's the message we said to each other, the message that we said to each other as a nation as a, and as a people, we're all here. We're all still here together. We're not alone. We're in this together. Isn't that a liberating message? That's a liberating message. You see, with God's help, Paul and Silas chose to trust their jailer, who by all accounts wasn't especially trustworthy. In fact, they took a huge gamble on his humanity. They wagered that the Spirit of God could be at work in his life, transforming him in such a way that together they would all know a greater liberation and freedom. Can you imagine a world like that, where we bet and wager on our common humanity and that God can change us and transform us and bring liberation and freedom to us all? That's the crazy kind of wager God has always been making on you and me. What happens next in this story is, is really one of the most touching and tender stories in all of Scripture and in the entire Bible, I think. The jailer takes these dangerous criminals who've disturbed the peace of the town. He takes them who've saved his life and imagine. He takes a basin of water and he takes a cloth, I imagine, and begins to wash the wounds of Paul and Silas. I can imagine the basin has the blood from their feet and the blood from their uh, hands where they've been bound in chains. And there, in that water, he washes them and, and heals them. And then in the end of the story, I can imagine he takes the same basin of water, even with that blood still there, and Paul and Silas do what? They baptize the jailer and his whole family. And then to add even more promise of liberation and freedom to the story, after all of that, the jailer invites Paul and Silas to a dinner at his home where they take bread and wine and break it and know the gift of God's freedom because the bread of Christ is always the promise of freedom. In the coming week, I have a hunch, you're going to hear some stories about why you, should be why you should be fearful of other people. In fact, I'll wager for the next several months, you're going to be told time and time and time again why you should be very afraid. I pray as we and you and I go forth into the world this week, we'll be aware and take notice of when it is that you feel fearful, when it is that you feel, feel mistrustful of other human beings. And when you feel that, I pray that the Spirit of God will come into your life and say, this is not what I am claiming. We're all still here. 
we are all still together, just as God is with us all, wagering that God will be with us as we seek to love each other in freedom. Let us pray. Liberating God, God of freedom and love. Through the whole course of your salvation history, you've been seeking the liberation and freedom of the children of God. From the story of the Exodus, when your people cried out in their suffering for deliverance and you sent them Moses. From the time of the prophets, who saw your people enslaved to sin and enslaved to violence and enslaved to greed. You sent your prophets to announce liberation and compassion for all people. From the time of Jesus, who preached that sermon in Nazareth and said, I've come to announce jubilee, the release to captives, the liberation of all of your children. And also from Paul and all the apostles and those who've served you through the ages, coming to announce a gospel of freedom. For as we love each other in freedom, we know we are set free. In your name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Freely we have received of God's goodness and grace. Let us freely share.
According to the Gospel of Luke, they will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the table of freedom, the bread of freedom, the bread and wine that are available to all who call Christ their Lord and Savior. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's a table of the family of God. May the God of wonder be with you. And also with you. Lift your hearts to the one who invites you to this table, calling, come, come. Thirsty for life and hope, we bring our hearts to this feast. Rejoice in the Lord, all you people. We sing glad songs of thanks to God's holy name. Friends, on the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would the elders come? Loving God, we have tasted of the bread of freedom. We have been able to drink of the cup of salvation. And just like that jailer long ages ago who asked, what must I do to be saved? Our deep question is, oh God, how can you bring a deeper, richer healing and restoration to our common humanity? How can you make us the liberated free children of God you intend for all of us. Help us to answer the call to set others free, <clears throat> those who remain in prison, who need to know that they are loved by you and by us, those who are imprisoned by their own fears and anxieties and sense of defeat and sinfulness. Help us to be people who bring words and actions of grace, and where whole communities feel oppressed and despairing and unable to see a promising future and hope, we pray that you will send messengers of justice, those who can help us learn how to live more fully together as your people in the coming richer kingdom that Christ preached. Go with us this day Send us to be witnesses to the freedom of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray and give thanks. Amen.
And now go out into the world in peace and in freedom. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, wash the wounds of others you meet. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Spirit, rest and abide with you all, both now and forever. And the risen Lord sends us even now. Amen.